Hi everybody and welcome to week two and this week's lecture on the second chapters in For Her Own Good and Studying Men and Masculinities. So I'm going to clip through this so it doesn't get too long. I, I want to say that I hope you give me feedback on how difficult or not this book is because I know that studying men is, is difficult and I just want to keep in touch about how you're doing on that. So use the discussion board to to tell me how you're doing. But the thing I want to emphasize in For Her Own Good is that uh, Aaron Reich and English decide to use the healing profession as the area to focus on when they talk about the rise of the experts. And I think that's really important for two reasons. The first reason is that the rise of the experts, the doctors, the psychiatrists, the um, who else, um, even the child rearing authorities, etc. The rise of the experts telling men or telling women in this case what to do continues today. And I think that with medicine, we all know this, that um, many things that, have, that are only female embodiment, like menstruation, um, menopause, childbirth, have become medicalized and taken on negative meaning and understanding. Um, you know, so for example, is there anything inherently wrong with a hot flash? I mean, is this a disease? Is there anything inherently wrong with not feeling like, like with not wanting to have sex when you're 60, but you should take a pill? So I, and I think that much damage continues to be done in this area, especially with childbirth. Um, and of course, there's been a whole movement toward home birth and doulas and midwives, etc. So I like this because I think there's a potential to find a lot of good research projects in the experts and women. So women's knowledge and expert knowledge. Um, I have a cold, so excuse me for my voice. I also think it's important because uh, they mentioned the uh, incalculable damage that the experts did to women in the late 18th century. And I want to give you another example of that. In 1837, I think, Theodore Bischoff, um, so this is the 19th century, a hundred years after they're talking about, a physician named Theodore Bischoff did a series of experiments on a dog. He cut the dog open and watched the ovaries of this female dog for six months. I, I hope he had two dogs, but at any rate, he discovered ovulation. They didn't have x-rays, they couldn't see, no ultrasound. So he had to physically operate, cut open the dog, watch the ovulation slowly happen, the menstrual cycle begin, and so he did this every day and discovered ovulation. Now this to us sounds like a no-brainer, but before this happened in, 1830, in the 1830s, doctors, these experts, told women that women could get pregnant when the, the blood from the menstrual cycle, when all that liquid was present, the, seam, the sperm and semen and menstrual blood, all that mixed together and helped the sperm go in. So that's when you got pregnant. If you did not want to get pregnant, you were safe to have intercourse in the dry phase, far away from the menstrual cycle. So what did women do? Women who did not want to have babies had intercourse when they were ovulating and of course had babies. So, um, so I just think that's an interesting example of how the damage that was done Okay, so this book, um, I like uh, Buckbinder's uh, very nice, or someone else's comparison, um, or no it is, thinking about sex and gender as the raw material and the processed product. So sex is just the body, is just the biological anatomy, uh, but gender are the practices and beliefs, performances, things we do, the way we act as either men or women. And he also talks about how it's a little complicated because 
um, when we say man or woman, we mean both that physical anatomy, but we also mean, in the course of casual conversation, those cultural practices. But we really want to sort, we want to strip those apart. So we want to have sex being just anatomy, and gender as those performances or cultural practices that we build up around either biological sex. Um, and the processed material, I like that because if you think, and we even use the word, how processed is she? Like how processed a woman can be? And I don't know if we use it quite the same way as a man, but, um, but it's achieving that hyper-femininity, you know, with hair and makeup and nails and even plastic surgery, whatever. So uh, I like that processed product. And then um, on page 27, he talks about Gail Rubin's work, uh, and Rubin says, Hunger is hunger, but what counts as food is culturally determined and obtained. Sex is sex, but what counts as sex is equally culturally determined and obtained. So the ways in which, so there's nothing innate about sex and what, we, what constitutes correct or normal sex. In fact, um, Buckbinder urges us to get rid of the concept of normalcy altogether and think in terms of um, practices and cultural imperatives to act in a certain way. Uh, oh, so normalcy. Um, normalcy stems out of essentialism. So Buckbinder talks about two different kinds of theories for understanding the world. One is essentialism and the other is, does he say constructionism or constructivist? I can't remember. I think it's constructivist. Constructionist or, or constructivist. So um, essentialism basically says, you know that phrase, it is what it is, it is what it is. Things are organically, innately, um, biologically, just the way they are, and it's kind of, that's nature. Constructionism says that we produce these things, that there are systems that um, construct our categories of meaning, that meaning doesn't just come down and land, but we kind of make it up. And he notes that uh, this has been called nature versus nurture, but it's a little more complicated than that because nature versus nurture, we tend to think of as who we are. Am I this way because my family or am I this way because it's who I am? Here we're talking about categories of meaning. So essentialism would be, you know, what, con what is a woman? We have an essentialist way of understanding it. It just is what it is. It's biology. Of course, women are just that way. And we have a constructionist way of understanding this, which is, well, it's not just biology. There are certain cultural beliefs, religious beliefs, economic needs, um, psychological beliefs that all go into how we define what a woman or a man is. So, so he's going to be, this book is more of a constructionist approach. Now, within that constructionist approach, you can be either ideological or discursive. You can be working with an ideology or examining a discourse. And an ideology, capitalism is an ideology, Marxism is an ideology, feminism is an ideology. It's a system of beliefs that values one way of being above another, and it's got a purpose. And I hope that Buckbinder tells us that um, ideology is not wrong or bad. We are steeped in ideology. Um, we live ideology. So I think on Friday in news, I posted an article in the New York Times about how we don't have the social mobility that Americans think we have, right? So because data shows that you have a very, <clears throat> very, very small chance of actually changing classes. So if you were born working class or poor, or lower middle class, you will stay there, and your children will stay there. It's very rare to make much movement. But we, 
I can't believe that to be true for me. You know, I mean, we have this myth in America that's, that we incorporate and internalize, that we can do it and make something of ourselves. And all evidence says that we're not going to, yet we continue to do it. So this is ideology at work, the power of ideology. Discourse really just looks at systems of organizing reality. I like that, systems of organizing reality and how systems of thought and behavior work. So, and then Buckbinder goes to Foucault. And I'm going to have to talk more about Foucault later. I don't want to go on and on too much. But the important things that I want you to take away from the Foucault piece is that um, Foucault, Michel Foucault, a French philosopher whose work deeply shapes the way I think, um, he believes that uh, two things about power. One, the ultimate power is the ability to produce truth. The ultimate power is the ability to produce truth. Now again, remember that essentialism and constructionism. So essentialism, you don't produce truth. Something just is true because it's true, natural. And constructionism says you produce, you create a truth. It's not just like born naturally. So Foucault says that the ultimate power is the ability to produce truth. And I happen to agree with that. I will give you a couple of examples, or one. Well, two, um, the power to produce truth. So do you remember when we invaded, the United States invaded Iraq in 2003? It was because the United Nations workers on the ground had found evidence of weapons of mass destruction and we knew, it was true, there was evidence that there were weapons of mass destruction. And that truth that was produced meant every member of Congress, or almost every member, ex including Democrats, voted to go to war to invade Iraq based on that truth. And the history of the world changed. And it turned out not to be true. Um, a smaller example is you know, when my kids, my little guy, when he was, my youngest is just 11, and he was on the edge of believing in Santa Claus for the past couple of years. And if I had said to him, of course there's not a Santa Claus, it would have, sh his there is a, it shattered his world. There would have been a moment he believed and a moment he didn't, because I produced the truth for him. But if I look that kid in the eye and say, of course Santa exists, he believes it. And we tell this lie to all children. So we're all engaged in producing this great big lie. Um, and that's the power to produce truth. So um, I'm trying to produce truth here too, but also hopefully to give you some of the tools that you need to recognize my attempt to produce knowledge and truth so that you can question what I'm saying as well. So, and the other thing that Foucault uh, says that I like a lot is um, that uh, power isn't something big up here forcing down on something. Power is more like the water that seeps through the cracks in the rock and eventually that water will erode a sidewalk or break down a wall. Power is diffused, it's pocketed, it's all over. We each have power. So it's a much more emancipatory uh, sense of power. I'm going to try to sneak in one more thing. I think it's on page 42. And this, I really want you to think about this. Um, epistemy in England, that, that's just, uh, epistemology is how we know what we know. So he's talking about like just how we knew what we knew in England in the what is it, Mid in the 13th century, and he talks about the humors, the f melancholic, choleric, choleric, and phlegmic, um, and he says that it's important that that's not only how the world was understood, but how it was perceived. So people understood intellectually that if um, someone was uh, kind of crabby and 
um, Carmigiani, they might be Flemic, you know, and kind of, it's because they had too much phlegm in them. They knew that that was what caused that, that was what's going on. But the people also experienced that. They felt like, oh, I'm, I'm phlegmic today, or, you know, I'm melancholic. I'm consumed with melancholy. They experienced themselves and understood themselves within those terms. And it's like, and we are doing the same thing. We are doing the same thing. We are experiencing ourselves as uh, menstruating, as having PMS, as having testosterone. We are experiencing ourselves within these systems of medical knowledge that we've been given that explain us. Right? So it's not just that we understand ourselves in a certain way, but we live it and experience it and feel it. And I, I, this is extremely important. So, um, it, you know, it's like even as we analyze and critique a lot of these practices about gender, gender practices, we all still probably, we do, we participate in them and we feel them and we understand ourselves as men and as women. So, um, okay, I think that is it. And hopefully this helps shed a little bit of light on the two books, particularly studying men. Okay, bye-bye.